What we're gonna do in this video is see how we can take a material like asphalt and make it look like it's wet, as if it just finished raining or perhaps is currently raining. Uh, and this technique can be applied to pretty much any other material. Uh, so if you do want to make something look wet, um, like it just finished raining, or like I said, currently raining, this should work. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so here's what we're gonna be trying to accomplish today with this video, creating this material that lets us create almost like puddles. And if you use some of the techniques covered in some of my previous videos, you can even add a particle system emitter to kind of get raindrops to influence the material as well. So let's go ahead and dive in here. Um, and what we're starting with is just kind of some basic stuff. So a piece of geometry for the curb, I'm not even gonna have a material on it, um, a plane for the road, and a dome light uh, with the, the light, the image being the texture being a ZBrush exterior Barcelona, whatever. I'm guessing that is comes with um, in the asset browser and is not a part of the Grayscale Gorilla uh, subscription that I have, but I'm not 100% certain about that. So uh, let's go ahead and create a new material. I'm go going to apply it to the road. There's actually different, a couple of different ways you can approach creating a material like this, and I'll cover both of those, but I'm gonna open this material, dock my node editor down here, okay. Give me some more space to work with and start by creating a texture node. And once I have one texture node, um, I'm gonna duplicate it out a couple of times because I know I'm gonna need those uh, later on. Okay, why don't we also create a butt map node while we're here since once again, I know I'm gonna want one of those and a max on noise, just so we get that out of the way. And just to kind of cut to the chase for anybody um, who's not sure, um, a lot of what we're doing here is gonna be controlled by the uh, reflection color as well as reflection roughness. And we can use a noise to do this um, in a single material, or if you're gonna use a, a material blender, which we'll talk about and see, um, you know, the noise can blend between two different materials here. Uh, so for instance, if we create our kind of wet or our dry material, so I'll take the roughness here to zero. Actually, I'm, this will be wet. Maybe even increase the IOR so we can see this a bit more. This HDRI isn't necessarily the best, but at least it's reflective. So we at least you know, get something to, to show. And it's still a little overcast, maybe even a bit sunny. Um, you know, It can rain when the sun's out here in Florida. But what we're essentially gonna be doing is taking a noise and using that to control reflection roughness, right? And you can kind of see how that allows us to have some areas of more reflection or less reflection, but also use this to control the reflection color. Okay. And um, the difference here is we need black and white to mean different things because for reflection color, black means no reflection, white means 100% um, reflection, whereas roughness, black means um, mirror-like, white means uh, very rough. So I'm gonna take an invert. Really, I'm looking for the color invert. And I'm gonna drop that onto the roughness there, okay? And it would also help if we solo this note so we can see our pattern. And I'm gonna to go to the output section here as well as the input because it, I'm gonna scale this up a little bit so we get some larger patterns there, okay? So something maybe like that may want to change the pattern itself from noise to say um, displaced turbulence, I think. And I know some, some of those are cut off that we can make work. Uh, if we go a bit further down here to the output section and find low and high clip, we do want really just black and white values. A little bit of gray isn't too bad, um, but the more those values we have, the better. So that looks okay. We can make that work. Maybe even bump up the scale just a little bit more to say closer to four and a half, five. All right. And now when I unsolo this, what we're going to see is the darker areas are not reflective, where the brighter areas are. And those are our puddles. Okay. And so we have this with just a plain material. Um, but we can also do this with a texture. And that's where things can get a little bit more 
convoluted. So if I come in here and grab a material I'm gonna use for this, this is just um, from, um, uh, where's it from? It's from C4D Center, their free material library. It's the abandoned asphalt. I wanna make sure to give credit there. But just gonna use the base color, plug that in. Okay, do the same for our bump or a normal in this case. I'm not gonna use ambient occlusion or uh, displacement for this. Like ambient occlusion is more of a real time thing anyway. Um, since I did load my normal map into this, I wanna make sure in my bump channel here, I switch this to tangent space normal. And what you'll see is when we load in that um, normal map, that's now aff affecting our puddles, which maybe that's what you want, maybe it, it isn't, um, but that's where things, like I said, can start to get confusing because if we also wanted to load in our roughness in here, right, and connect that, well, now we have two different things we want to combine for roughness as well as two different things we want to combine for bump. Now, you can do all this in a single material. What I would do for the bump map is to kind of cheat this, switch it back to a height field, and then use a bump map blender. And with our roughness here, or even, yeah, roughness, um, I would use a multiply or add. Um, I think we would want to use multiply to add the darker values on top, um, but that's what we would do. So instead, what I'll show you is a little bit easier way to do this. And I'm gonna go a bit backwards here because I'm gonna create my dry material now. So I'm gonna get rid of, at least disconnect that Maxon noise. I'm not gonna get rid of it completely. Connect our roughness. Okay, so we can have that. I don't need the IOR here to be quite so high. And really, that wasn't very realistic. It was just for kind of preview purposes so we could see this a little bit better. So something like that's looking pretty good. Switch this back to tangent space normal. And, you know, because of this, this plane is so long, I may even switch the projection here in our um, material tag from UVW mapping to cubic. Get this a little bit smaller, looking a little bit better. Okay, and that's looking pretty good. All right, so we have our kind of dry material done. So why don't we name this dry? Um, I'm gonna just duplicate this material and call it, actually, I can't duplicate it in here. Um, well, I can call this wet uh, because we're essentially gonna be creating a second material, but we have to do it in our node editor. Unfortunately, you can't like drag a material into your node editor from outside of it. Uh, like you could say in Octane, if you were gonna work with a mixed material, really miss that functionality. Um, but what we can do here is work with a material um, layer. You could also work with a material blender. The process would be very similar. Um, but this material layer is going to allow us to combine two materials, okay? So I'm gonna need to connect the material layer out to our surface, and I'll connect our dry material here to the base material color. So we really shouldn't see anything change at this point, but what we can now do is create a new material and connect it to a uh, layer one. And what's going to be the easiest thing to do is just to duplicate our existing material. So I just selected all my no nodes, held down control and clicked and dragged, just like if you were duplicating something else. And this one though, like I said, it's gonna be our wet material. So I don't really want a normal map or a bump map. I even don't want the roughness. All I really want here is our base color. And you can see how it's, you know, shiny. And once again, if we were gonna cheat this just to make it a little bit easier to see for this, perhaps increasing the IOR to three could help. And from there, I will take the out color and connect it to the layer one color, okay? now. To control what material we're seeing and where, we have this mask. And we can, you can see as we, can, we adjust this value, we'll see one material um, or the other, okay? Now, for whatever reason, it's not updating. Let's make sure, yeah, we have our dry material on there. Oh, we don't have the correct material on there. So it's now our wet material that we want to be applied to everything, there we go. So as I was showing before, mask zero could be dry. 
once it updates. If it updates, we'll just force it to update. There we go. Mask of one will be wet. I don't know why I keep going over there to look to refresh it, but yeah, there we go. Um, and instead of just using that value, we can use our max on noise to do it just like before. So I'll connect that to our material layer, layer one, mask. Okay, and there you have it. We have our wet, we have our dry, and it's still all being controlled by our mask. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. Okay, what if we wanted to push this further? There's a few different ways I can see this because right now, this is still pretty flat, right? We have a little bit of normal from the road. We don't really have anything from our puddles. So what we could do, if we wanted to get really crazy, is maybe take a displacement node, connect our noise to our displacement node is the texture map input. Connect that to the displacement for this whole thing. And to get that displacement really working, we need to add a redshift object tag. Okay, in the geometry section, check override, enable displacement. All right, and maybe we're starting to see a little bit of it there. We actually are. Right? You can kind of see now how it's puddling. It still looks a little low resolution, though, all things considered. Um, and that's probably because we don't have enough geometry in our road. There's really two ways you could fix that. One would be to add more segments in um, the piece of geometry itself. Since it is a primitive, it'd be very easy for me to just increase this. I would wanna try and do my best to make sure these are actually squares though. So I may need to stop the rendering. We can see that these are rectangles, so it should be the width here. We can just increase till we get something that looks kind of square-like. Okay, perhaps too much down just a little bit there, maybe like 250. Great, we'll see if that gives us a little bit more detail. And it does, but it still looks, you know, kind of very old video game like. Okay, so that will be fixed back in our um, Redshift object tag. We've already enabled displacement. Um, we can also enable tessellation. And I also like to uncheck enable auto bump mapping as well. Uh, because that what there have been a number of times where I've gotten confused and thought I was getting displacement, and it turns out it's just auto bump mapping. So enabling tessellation is going to help with this uh, as well. All right, though it doesn't seem to be making too much of a change there. Um, you could always reduce the minimum edge length and increase the maximum subdivisions. Though do be careful because that can increase the amount of RAM, um, video RAM something needs to render, and depending on the graphics card of your computer that could be problematic. And so this is pretty much it for the material part of this. Now, once again, if you wanted to take this further, like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, using a particle system, well, um, you could watch, uh, I think it was one of my last video or two where I did the, the rain kind of condensation going, falling down, um, dripping down a window. It's pretty much that same process, but I'll go ahead and get it started here. Don't know if we'll take it all the way complete. Um, but we're going to start by adding a vertex map to our object, our road. Okay, don't need this to render right now. And the resolution of this vertex map is determined by the number of polygons we have in it. So it may be worth doubling this one more time. And it may also be worth kind of disabling tessellation at that point, at least for right now since we would be increasing the number of polygons in Cinema 4D is gonna have to deal with, or Redshift is gonna have to deal with by quite a bit. So, okay, back to our vertex map. That's all well and good now. Now we need our emitter. So I'm gonna come up here to simulate, create an emitter, and make sure I rotate this so it's pointing down. What's great about this, we don't actually need any geometry for this since it's just, uh, you know, gonna be used in a material. I switch to a top view so I can go to the emitter tab and adjust the X and Y size so that it's just a bit larger than my road. That way we get some pretty good coverage there. And so now if I hit play, 
can see that. It's a great thing about Cinema 4D's uh, particle system, you get rain pretty easily. And to get that to affect our vertex map, all we do is drag it in here and particle object is gonna work just fine. And right now you can see how we're getting those little flashes. Okay, they're way too big. Okay, and if you select the emitter, you can turn down the radius to really as small as you want. Keep in mind, the size does depend on, or how good, how small you can go with radius does depend on how many polygons you have in your object. So two here might actually be a bit too small. So let's try like five, see if we can get something. All right, so getting a little, little whoop there. You'll also notice um, that we don't have very many of those. And so I'll go back into the emitter, and maybe increase these to say, I don't know, we'll, we'll get crazy and go with like 100. That way we can see these for sure. So I'll just copy that also into the uh, birth rate for the renderer. So those are the same, there we go. So that's looking pretty good. You can see how quickly those disappear though. And you know, as I've mentioned now in a few videos, we can use, um, we can fix that by adding say, either a decay or a delay, okay? The decay will slow it down, right? You want to slow down more, just do that. All right, another approach to this could be to use the delay. Since that if you actually Keep it in smooth will actually fade out pretty nicely. I actually like that quite a bit more. Okay. Uh, but we can also use spring mode, which will give us a little bit kind of of it kind of moving up and down a little. Now we don't get a ring like a concentric circle as if a, a droplet had just dropped into, you know, um, a cup of water or something. Um, it may be worth doing a video about that at some point, but just for some quick kind of raindrops, you know, something like this could work. You can even combine it as well to get something even slower. And now what we need to do is integrate this vertex map into our texture. And you could integrate this in a couple of different places in a couple of different ways. You could integrate it into, um, the bump map, perhaps for the reflective material. Okay. Um, and you would do that using the vertex attribute, okay? Um, you could also do it into the reflectivity or even the reflectivity um, or even the reflection roughness. Uh, so reflection color or reflection roughness properties as well if you wanted to add it to everything, okay? But like I said, I've kind of covered that in quite a few videos at this point, so I don't think I need to go into any more details about that for right now. You can check out those videos. That will do it for this video. If there's anything else you want to see, please let me know. If you go ahead and like this video and subscribe to the channel, I'd really appreciate it. And until next time, take care.